Before I invite Thomas, just to make a quick housekeeping announcement, uh, please type in your questions and comments in the chat uh, as the panelists are presenting. And uh, my co-host Steph will moderate that. So Thomas, start us off with how it all began. Um, well, gosh. So, so I, I guess for me, it actually um, all began with, um, with Battle of the Chefs, um, the TV show um, in Zimbabwe that we have, the cooking competition. Um, I, I started working in season two on the show and um, basically had this idea that uh, we could uh, leverage basically having access to this great set, um, all the, the, the costumes from the TV show, the props, um, which, you know, um, had all, all already obviously been organized for the show, um, and then build a story around that. For me, I think, um, you know, every, every story at the end of the day is actually just about, about human, you know, uh, characters. Um, so it, it, you know, you, you have some kind of premise that the story is set in, you know, be it whatever, the, the world of, of racing or the world of football or in our case, the world of, you know, cooking competitions. But at the end of the day, the story is about relationships, about, about people. But it's, if you want to project something that then feels genuine, it, it, it needs to be something that you have a little bit of background in. And so for me, food was quite an obvious choice um, because having grown up, um, so, so both my grandmothers on, on both sides of my family were, were very talented and enthusiastic chefs. So I kind of grew up as a child, spent a lot of time in the kitchen with my grandparents cooking um, you know, in, in different situations. And, and so to me that the world of like, of, of the kind of conversations and the way that life continues uh, around, you know, kitchens, dining room tables, to me it made logical sense that you could have a film, you could have a story that at its heart is really about friendships and family. But the thing that keeps linking everybody together is, and we really tried with Cook Off almost, almost every single scene is set either you know where somebody is cooking or where people are eating not not every but you know we really tried to base the movie in this world where where food is our focus so i guess that's that's how the film um came into being um obviously there are you know there are there's are details and and crazy stories about um how we actually made the film um, because we didn't have uh, a lot of resources. Um, but we were lucky that the, the biggest resource that we did have was relationships. So uh, a relationship with Battle of the Chefs, um, with the TV show, that meant we could come to an arrangement to use the set um, and the costumes. Um, arrangements also with... Um, uh, uh, Stephen Hyde, who's the... the the head chief judge normally on the TV show who became our food designer for the film so that we could have like, you know, realistic, uh, you know, chef battles going on. Um, and then, and then relationships that I'd, I'd built up, you know, personally and partly through working as in battle of the chefs with some of the restaurants in Harare, which meant that we were able to use some of those, as sets, as different locations, so that the film felt more genuine, you know, being, being set in real, real places. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, that's awesome. And so, Tendai, you came in as the lead actress. What was your journey to cook off? Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy to be part of this uh, amazing platform. Um, just to say hi, Pat. <laughs> She looks so great, I miss her. Okay, um, just to answer your question, uh, Lucia, it's so um, interesting how I got into the project because I am literally um, at the early stages of my career. And so um, I had worked in a couple of TV shows. I studied at UCT um, and I graduated and kind of had a couple of years where I was 
auditioning and really hustling. Um, I know freelancers will understand what I'm trying to say when I say hustle, but I'd been hustling for a couple of years and then I um, eventually got onto a couple of TV shows in South Africa where I'm based at the moment in Johannesburg. And so there's this one year where I had an awakening and I decided, you know what, instead of waiting for, um, waiting for opportunity, I really wanted to just go out there and kind of look for my own opportunities. And so I, I inboxed uh, Joe Jagu, who's the producer of Cook Off. He was literally one of two producers that I knew in Zimbabwe. I'd never worked in Zimbabwe. And so I messaged him on Facebook to just tell him that I'd be in Zimbabwe for a month. And I, I just wanted something to do. I didn't actually uh, have any plans to act in anything. I just wanted to go and you know, check out film sets in Zimbabwe. And lo and behold, um, they were about to start filming Cook Off and they were still uh, deciding on who their lead actress was. And so he eventually connected me with Thomas Brickell um, online. And so we spoke, he sent me the script and I, I sent him a showreel and we both decided we wanted to be, uh, to work together on this project. And for me, that was such a breakthrough for me because I'd been really um, wanting to work on a, a film. It was my first feature, feature film. And so it was a major breakthrough and for it to be a Zimbabwean film um, was even an extra bonus because um, I, I didn't think I would, I would be acting in a film from Zimbabwe anytime soon at that time. Um, and so, yeah, so it was great. I read the script and I fell in love with Anesu. I fell in love with the story. It was very well written. And I always tell Thomas that it was very well written. <laughs> so, but I was really happy to be a lead actress on the film. And how did being on a Zimbabwean set differ for you from your experiences in South Africa? Well, definitely there's a huge difference because as some of you might know, in Zimbabwe, uh, our industry is still developing. There's still so much to do uh, that can be done to make it um, um, just, I don't know, to have structures, to have, we don't have enough funding, all those things. So comparing it to South Africa, I would say, um, I mean, to be honest, for a Zimbabwean set, I think that there weren't too many differences. I think the difference was maybe the evidence of um, a lack of like funding because it wasn't like luxury sets or like, I don't know how to explain it. It was very, um, it was an independent film, first of all. So obviously they were using money from their own pockets. And so we didn't have like extra bits that you'll find on a set that's maybe being sponsored by a broadcaster or something like Netflix, for example. And so um, um, to be honest with you, as a lead actress and it being my first time acting in a film, I was so focused on the script most of the time. <laughs> I didn't even notice much of the disparities, um, but I was literally just focused on my script and making sure I remembered all my lines. I was, uh, <laughs> I was so yeah. focused on that. Um, but there was a big difference in terms of just like I said, the lack of funding. Um, they were really trying to make it work. Also in Zimbabwe, power cuts um, and things like that. So you can imagine, I'm sure Thomas has more details because he's part of the production team. He could uh, maybe tell you more about um, the differences. Yeah, go ahead, Thomas, uh, enlighten us on some of the, the ins and outs that went into the actual production of the, of the show. Um, I think it's quite interesting. We have a, a, a varied audience um, here tonight, some of whom are students at Wellesley, you know, film students. I think it's, it's also a really great opportunity to hear about the behind the scenes of, of actually making a film, the, the, the sort of bones and um, meat attached to the process. Um, so, uh, well, I can't, I can't talk um, specifically about the differences between Zimbabwean and South African film sets, because um, to be honest, um, I, I've, I don't know that I've been on a film set in South Africa. I have in, in the UK, um, in, in, in other countries, just not in, in South Africa. Um, and I think, you know, as Tendi says, um, you know, the, the, the thing that we didn't have was, you know, was a big budget, was, uh, you, know, a, you know, loads of money behind the film. And generally that's that, you know, films actually are kind of known for that, that they, they tend to, to, you know, look after you very nicely. 
Um, I mean, we we tried within the uh, the confines of you know the resources that we had to make sure that everyone got uh, got fed. Um, right. And, you know what, that. What was the budget? Food. What was the budget for the film? Um, so the 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 basically the the cash budget that we had to produce the film. It's not like the budget for the whole film because they're things that we did basically leveraging with the cast and the crew um, that they would only get paid once we managed to sell the film. So there were certain upfront costs that we removed from, you know, from the budget, including the equipment. We cut in, uh, you know, a, a co-producer who was one, a local equipment hire company in Zimbabwe called MMX. So they became a co-producer co on the film in return for then giving us equipment to use to shoot the film. So we kind of leveraged where we could. And basically we had $8,000. That was our, well, slightly under, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that was our cash budget. So out of that, we had to work out how to, you know, keep everybody fed and watered and, and you know, and transported, you know, from, from home to set every day so that we could complete the film. And I think what we tried to do is whether we had the money or not to do things at a fancy level, we tried to have all the, all the nuts and bolts there, e even if they were in a slightly more uh, humble form, you know? So, you know, we still, we still went through, uh, you know, our, our shot lists in the, at the beginning of the day, um, you know, there was a makeup department and a wardrobe department that, you know, looked after the, the, the actors before they came on to set. Um, you know, we, we kind of, we had all the, all the moving parts of a professional, you know, fully paid film set. It's just that we were doing it on that budget without, without those resources behind us. And I think that right. was only possible because we had a lot of, you know, professional people, but that, that weren't working. They didn't, we didn't have work in Zim. So it, it meant that we were able to dedicate some time to this project, uh, you know, in the hope that we could showcase that we really did have the talent and the, the skills to produce something uh, worthy. Yeah. And um, someone as I was asking in the chat, how did you get Netflix's interest? Um, well, uh, it, it, um, as, as these things always do, um, you don't, you don't get to speak directly to, um, you know, to the, to the, just, um, the end platform, you know, you don't speak to Netflix or to, to iTunes or Amazon or whatever you go through, you know, uh, a, a third party. So in our case, we have a South African distributor. Um, they had originally saw the film, but a kind of earlier version of the film. It, it wasn't, we, we hadn't uh, finished the final cut of the film, but we uh, showed it at a Durban Film Festival. Um, and so we, we met the distributor there. They were interested, but you know, they were a bit lukewarm about the film at that stage. Um, but then later on, they approached us and said they wanted to see it again and they wanted to try and submit it to Netflix. And by now we'd managed to do a lot of work um, polishing up the film. Actually a nice tenuous link uh, back to your previous uh, episode. Uh, so we were in Nairobi to do the, the final uh, polish of the film. So the final cut and the picture grade of the film uh, were done in Nairobi with a company called QBF, uh, Quite Bright Films that incidentally are also involved in a whole load of other uh, food related programs in uh, Kenya. So they make the Kenyan Bake Off um, and they made something called Fearless Chef. That was oh, like okay. A, yeah. Yeah, um, oh, that's awesome. So we were just very lucky to, to have them as a, as a, you know, a partner and a friend um, to help us out at that stage and put the final polish uh, onto the film. And then run me through the timeline. I know uh, Tendai mentioned to me she had filmed, she filmed all her scenes in, the, in a month, in about July, and then you got into a bit of August 2017. Um, yeah, so well, I mean, we had, we had Tendi for a limited amount of time. 
But when we finished the main shoot with Tandy, we didn't quite have a finished film yet because, you know, I think there are always problems and delays and stuff. But with our case, we had the kind of added complication that we knew Tendi wouldn't be in the country, you know, straight after we finished filming. Um, so, so we had, we desperately had to finish everything with her. So we ended up kind of postponing a few other uh, scenes and stuff as we were running behind so that we could make sure we finished all of Tendi's stuff. And then um, basically, yeah, had like a, a three weeks, uh, four weeks break whilst the editor was basically putting together the first uh, assembly rough cut of the film so that he could tell us if there was anything that we'd missed. And then basically we had an extra week where we filmed uh, the couple of the missing scenes and then extra shots that, that you know, we discovered that uh, we hadn't quite managed to capture. Um, so yeah, that was that basically took us through to, um, you know, November uh, 2017. It was a very quiet month in Zimbabwe. Nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, expand on that for, for those. <laughs> um, so, well, I'm sure you just say, if you know, you know. Uh, there, were, there were bigger things going on uh, right. in Zimbabwe. The military-assisted um, transition. Yes. There was a military assisted transition, exactly. Right. Not a coup, something else. Not a coup. Similar, similar but different. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and I actually remember like being in my, in my house, in my yard, and it was like early morning. I'd just gone outside to have a cup of tea, and I was going to walk across to MMX where I was doing the, um, the, the credits for, for the film. Like, you know, the kind of first version of the film was basically assembled by that stage. And I was just going through and writing the credits. And this like army helicopter like buzzed really low over the trees uh, in the yard. And I kind of looked up and I thought like, gosh, what, what's really going on here? You know, because I mean, this was before it really, you know, soldiers came on the TV. It was just in the build up to that. And, um, but then I thought, well, you know, I, I'm still at work here. So, you know, dutifully walked down to, to the edit suite. And, and that's when I got there. I hadn't, I hadn't been on social media that morning. So I basically missed everything. I didn't know that, you know, there was this, this big crazy thing happening. And then when I got there, everyone was talking about it. Um, and so was, that's, that's how I discovered. Um, wow. But yeah, in, in a sense, then it, it kind of gave us a, a dubious claim to fame for Cook Off in that we were the first Zimbabwean film to be screened after the, uh, the fall of Robert. Um, yeah. Um, so again, we, we, didn't have, uh, we didn't have budget to have a fancy premiere, although we would love to have, you know, thrown some, some extravagant bash to celebrate. Um, but we basically ended up um, uh, building our own screen, like out of, you know, sheets sh sewn together and some lighting stands to hold it up and borrowed a projector, borrowed a PA system and built our own cinema on the roof of the Ambassador Hotel in, in central Harare. Um, wow. Yeah, and that's, that's the first place that we actually screened the film, you know, for an audience. And the first time that we knew we actually had really managed to make something, you know, proper. Wow, yeah. wow. Um, yeah, that's incredible. Tendai, I wanted to ask you about, Thomas has mentioned so much about relationships and this film being built on relationships. What was it like for you on the set with the different Zimbabwean actors? It was amazing. Um, I'd grown up watching some of them uh, on TV. And so just, I'd even studied, um, while I was doing film at UCT, we did, um, the University of Cape Town, we did a, a course where we watched African films and um, African films that um, focused on women in particular. And we'd watched Neria at university. And you can imagine me being a Zimbabwean in South Africa thinking, oh my gosh, what? They, they show Neria here and, you know, it was so exciting, but now having to act with her was mind blowing. I, I never imagined that I would act with such a legend, Jesse Mgoshi. So 
Um, and I'd also read her husband's books, Charles Ngoshi, in high school. So just the connecting with people that I really admired and who inspired me was such a monumental, um, a monumental uh, part of my life and my career, especially. And so, yeah, so Jessica Ngoshi was there, Kudai Sevenzo was there, um, some theater legends were also there, and I was just every day or like most days when we had like special guests coming on to set for specific scenes i'd be like oh my gosh today we've got this person i'd be so excited <laughs> i remember i was just in awe of everything really it yeah. was really great um, yeah and, and how did this role differ to the roles that you were playing in south africa before like up until um, so point? So one of the things that had led me to now want to look for my own opportunities was the fact that here in South Africa, um, as a Zimbabwe national, I was actually getting a lot of um, Zimbabwean roles, but the women I was playing um, were either maids, prostitutes, or they were being trafficked. They were always in a very um, difficult victim, victim kind of scenario. And it was really depressing, I won't lie. <laughs> Um, not that, not to say that those stories are not important. They are extremely important. Um, but I think a part of me was just really, really craving for more empowered, empowering roles or roles that really depicted women from my country in a way that empowered them and that showed, because I think there always has to be a balance. And this is my opinion in terms of storytelling. Um, it's great to show reality as it is, but it's also, it's almost like it's a two-sided coin. Storytelling is a two-sided coin. One is reality, authenticity, and the other side is aspiration and inspiration. And so for me, it's like, okay, there are enough stories about how, you know, Zimbabweans are going through the most, but are there any stories about Zimbabweans actually succeeding? Because there are stories like that in the world where even people like you, Lucia, you're doing amazing. Like, you know, there's so many Zimbabwean women who are also doing amazing things around the world. <laughs> so those stories also need to be told. And so I was really, really um, craving for those kinds of roles myself. Like, okay, can I act a Zimbabwean woman who is empowered, who's taking charge of her life? And I think Anis just did that in Cook Off. So I was really happy to act. Well, that's yeah. awesome. And do you, do you cook or did the film get you excited about cooking, more excited about cooking? Um, definitely okay. more excitement about cooking. Um, whether I cook more, to be honest, as an as, as a African woman, I'm sure we all know that most of our mothers make sure that we can cook and that we cook regularly. <laughs> so cooking wise, I'm always cooking um, every other day, if not every day. But uh, my brother is the chef in our family. So he's got a particularly high interest in cooking. So he will do like the special dishes. I'm more of your uh, authentic homemade delicious uh, meals. <laughs> I'm That's still awesome. That I'm not yet a chef. <laughs> I don't right. want to see anyone's uh, appetite. By <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, wow. Okay. So our next panelist, uh, is a global citizen in perhaps the tastiest sense uh, on that chef note, having trained and worked in South Africa and also worked in Italy and Ethiopia. Uh, my introduction to Tafazwa was through the Zimbabwean cooking competition that Thomas mentioned uh, that the movie Cook Off is based on called Battle of the Chefs. All three seasons are up on YouTube. Not only was Tafadzo the winner of season one in 2015, he was later a judge on season three. So welcome, uh, Taf um, Tafadzo. And before your demonstration, could you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a food creative? Thank you, Lucia. Uh, hi, guys. Um, my name is Tafadzo Anifasi for the Ankara Chef. Uh, my journey, um, I always say that it started in a moment of curiosity, I guess. I saw someone frying an egg and they were lathering the egg with oil. And for me, that was a cooking method that I'd never seen. So from that moment, I became curious about food. Uh, from that point, I then went to Botswana to stay with my parents after my degree in finance. And uh, because of this curiosity, I started cooking 
putting my Zoic Russian shoes and things like that. My parents were my guinea, guinea pigs at the time. And my dad is the one who actually said, why don't you go to chef school? So uh, I said, okay, well, why not? I went to chef school in South Africa, Warwick chef school in Harmonus. Uh, studied there for six months. I didn't want to go for the whole four years because I had done another four years studying something else. So I did six months French contemporary cuisine, which basically teaches you the basics of cooking. And then uh, after that, I worked in South Africa at an Oliver State. And then, yeah, I got the opportunity to work for the ambassador of Zimbabwe in, in Rome, Italy. And obviously that's where the, the, the passion of food came through. Uh, I ate a dish there of guru, which is your tribe, which was cooked with uh, white wine and anchovies and dried mint. And again, that was like, okay, I've had this ingredient before. I've had this dish before, but it was cooked in a different way. So that kind of then informed my, my, my kind of food right now as, as a fusion chef. Uh, I stayed in Ethiopia after that for two years and the spices and the introduction of injera, which is a bit sour, also informed my palate. And then I was fortunate enough to come back home and then better of the chefs happened. Uh, which I think was the biggest influence on my food journey because uh, all the dishes that we did in season one, I'd never cooked them before. Uh, it was just uh, looking for dishes all across the world and then trying to see what ingredients are available. And in the final, we actually cooked uh, starter, which was a fusion of Indian and Ethiopian. And uh, the main course was our take on Sadza and Nyama. Uh, and obviously we won, so that gave me the confidence that you know the, the the judges and the chefs like Chef Hyde uh, like my food, so obviously uh, there's something there. So I started then private chefing after that, and uh, the Ankara chef came from that period where I used to wear like African print pants on the show. Uh, the point at that time was just to stand out, but then uh, then started looking at my food. It's colorful, it's bold, just like the African print, just like Africans, and that's where the Ankara chef come from. So now I'm. Uh, more of a private chef, fusion chef. I'm really interested in our cuisine, in African cuisine, and trying to uh, give it my take and modernize it, if you if you will. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Okay, great. And so launch us straight into your demo. You had told me Hi, so. something about Mosby. <laughs> okay, so one of the dishes that I, I had the opportunity to grow up in the rural areas and this is one of the dishes my grandmother used to make. You know, like, unlike other chefs where you, you grow up and you used to cook with your mother or grandmother, I didn't have that, but my grandmother used to cook for us a few dishes and nopi was one of them. So this dish is based on nopi, which is basically your pumpkin and uh, peanut butter. So traditionally it would look kind of like this, you know, so this would be your nopi. So obviously I took this dish and I thought, okay, how can I modernize it? So I thought, why not a dessert? So I'm going to make uh, roasted pumpkin flapjacks with uh, peanut butter ice cream. So that, that's, that's the, the, the recipe we're going to do. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, right now I'm, I'm on this whole uh, don't chase recipes, chase flavor. A lot of people are like, ah, send me the recipe, give me this recipe. I believe that you don't, what can I say, you don't learn about food if you don't learn about flavor. So I'm trying to chase flavor. What flavor most do I remember? Those are the ones that I base my dishes on. So this recipe is going to be a bit haphazard, but uh, hopefully it will work out. So this is a bit of uh, demerara sugar or brown sugar, old-fashioned if you're in Zimbabwe. And then... Uh, Egg, so we're making the flapjack right now. Just uh, one egg. So I cook uh, by feel, as it was. So I'm gonna look at the ingredients and how they are feeling to the touch. So the egg and the sugar. Now we're going to put our flour, a little flour and some baking powder in there. So the, the beauty of this is just, uh, yeah, you can just kind of wing it. <laughs> I was just about to ask, but how much flour? How much flour? <laughs> okay, it's, it's about a cup and a half of flour. 
So that's the flour, and then we add our milk. I want it uh, lumps. Don't 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 worry about your lumps. I don't want it too wet as well. So probably half a cup of milk there. There you go. So I, I roasted um, my pumpkin. Just on 180 until they're done. And I uh, just smash them so they still have a bit of texture to them. So basically, we're trying to get the, the flavor of the pumpkin to come through. So this is yes. roasted, and then, uh, and then you've sort of mashed the pumpkin a bit? Like you've yeah, just, yeah, just slightly. Okay. You want some, some texture. You want to bite uh, through the pumpkin when you, when you have the flapjack. Oh, OK. All right. So yeah, so basically, that's our flapjack batter done. All right. In my stove, we'll agree to work here. So I'm using a bit of uh, batter here. I didn't want to put any butter in the butter because I want really the pumpkin to come through. I didn't want to dilute any of the flavor. So let's wait until this gets hot. This is such an incredible setup. And just to everyone um, who we saw creeping in the frame was Joseph, who is responsible yeah. for Battle of the Chefs. <laughs> And yeah. by extension, Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so our butter is nice and melted. I think I'm going to try and get two flapjacks out of this. Okay, so just a nice dollop of our batter. Oh, guess we're going to get more than two. So like I said, the key obviously to cooking is uh, trying and uh, experimenting. So this can go, I've done this with uh, various flavors. I've done it with some masala as well. So you can always uh, use various ingredients. We've got mahabros, which I'm using today for garnish, which are in season. So you can use those as well. Okay. And Mahabros are mulberry. Mulberry, yes. Us, mulberry. yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, what we're waiting for here is the once you see bubbles forming on top, then you know you can flip them over and then uh, we're ready. So, whilst those are going, uh, let me just explain on the ice cream as well. So, this time I'm using a cheats version. <laughs> so, you can either make your custard and churn in an ice cream machine. Or you can use this version, which is cream and uh, condensed milk. So we're going to mix in our cream. And we're going to have peanut butter as well. So this is the condensed milk. And this is the peanut butter. So this is about a half a cup of condensed milk and about two tablespoons of peanut butter. Mm. There you go. Put that together. So, Fonzo, I'm also curious how you find the Zim flavor profile or palette are different to other regions on the continent? Uh, well, we don't generally like our spices. <laughs> That's what I've realized. I used to have a, a salsa shop by the rank in Quaker where I'm from. And people would come in like, your food is nice, but my, my spice, I don't want that. too many spices. And I'd be like, That's why the food is nice, it's the spice. And uh, I'd use something like uh, bay leaf in my stews. At one point, someone came in and were like, oh, no, 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 no. 
<laughs> so I don't know whether the was moody or what. So, but generally we don't like our spice. Someone came and, and said, uh, "Sorry, I, I found a leaf in 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 the yeah, yeah, yeah. stew." Yeah. So we don't like our spice. We don't like uh, bitter notes, sour notes. Usually we like sweet and a bit neutral. That's why we can't put anything in our sadza, and we can't, uh, you know, huge up a few things in our in our cuisine. So I find that uh, we need to really inform our palates. Like uh, I'll be honest, until I went to chef school, there's some vegetables that I've never eaten, uh, ingredients that I've never seen, like eggplant or something like that. So definitely, I think we need to inform our palates. And the key to being a chef is your palate. If you do not have a palate, you can't be a chef. So I flipped over our flapjack. Now I'm just whisking uh, our cream. So you whisk your cream until it's stiff and then you add it to our condensed milk and peanut butter. Mix them together in the fridge and you're done. So there's one that I've done already, so I'll bring that out when we're now plating our dish. So our flat jacks are ready already, so that was quick. We have a comment here from pastry chef Mwaka. She says, as a pastry chef, I'm suffering. We work with very <laughs> precise measurements and there's such a difference to cuisine chefs. There is indeed. So we've done uh, the cream. I'm gonna add it to our, put a bit in there first. Incorporate that. So yeah, that is loose. Then we add uh, the remaining cream. So basically that is your ice cream base that you're going to put in your, your freezer overnight. And then presto, you got your ice cream. But as I said, this stage, if you like your crunchy, you can put crunchy peanut butter. You can use your almond peanut butter nowadays and uh, various nuts. And I discovered that you can actually have the hacha nuts as well recently. So there are various nuts that you can use. And uh, yeah, this is our peanut butter ice cream. I need to, yeah, I should get that. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to get my assistant to go and get uh, the ice cream that I've done. Uh, can I have a uh, bowl of water as well? All right. It's in the freezer in the yeah. Wonderful. You All are right. really so, on another level. <laughs> so I'm using, uh, so the garnish, for me, the garnish and your, your extras are what really define you as a cook, as a chef, whatever the things you like to, to, to eat. So when I'm cooking, I like to have texture and obviously different kind of flavor, your sweet, your bitter, your sour, but obviously your crunch. So I'm using the pumpkin seeds as a crunchy element. And also I put some berber, which is uh, an Ethiopian uh, chili. So to give it a bit of a bite as well. So, you know, I like my savory desserts. So that is part of the garnish. And as I said, our um, mahabros are in season, our um, mahabros. So I'm going to use those as well. And then I've got some uh, lemon curd in here. So yeah, those are the flavors that I want to come through in the, in the, in the dessert. And obviously when you plate also, that also determines uh, your character on a plate, like your, your plating and how you, you're going to plate. So for me, here's my plate. I think what I'm going to do is Uh, I brought you there. 
what I'll do is I'm going to smash them. Okay. And then play with our lemon curves. the asking that I did yesterday. Perfect. Mint for some, some green, and then there you go. That is our nopi. So, if I did this on a menu, I'll probably just write it as nopi so that the people kind of imagine the traditional nopi, and then when it comes through, it's uh, a work of art. So, that would be my Roasted uh, pumpkin flapjacks with peanut butter ice cream, some mulberries, and some uh, lemon curd. That is amazing. Wow. Mm. Thank you, Tafazba. No, you're welcome. We have a question from Jen um, saying, how do you approach when you want to add spice but your consumers or audience aren't as excited? Um, well, I guess in moderation, <laughs> in moderation, and uh, yeah, and explain everything, like uh, explain the spice, where it comes from, try to create a story, and uh, some uh, most times people are receptive to a story, so that's how I try it, in moderation, and uh, ask people if they want it spicier, if not, then I always try to make the spice come through as, as a flavoring and not too much as a punch to, to someone's palate. Amazing. Thank you, Tafadza. I was also wondering how do you see um, I was also wondering how you see Zim Cuisine being able to hold its own internationally. I think uh, I think we have to go back to the drain board, kind of investigate what our cuisine was or how can I say traditionally? Uh, because I think as chefs, I mean, I'll speak to my, for myself. Right now, I'm really on the craze to kind of understand uh, traditionally how we used to cook traditionally, what ingredients did we used to use, what cooking methods, smoking, uh, drying. And only when we understand uh, kind of like our past can we then innovate and, and uh, bring through different uh, uh, modern cuisine, but a cuisine that's based, backed by a story. Right now, uh, if you go to most of our hotels, restaurants, it's usually European food, uh, but there's no Zimbabwean food that has a story behind it. So if you go to Kariba, for instance, uh, what fish is there? How do they used to cook that fish? How do they preserve it? Uh, there's a way that people cook fish such that you can actually chew the bones. Uh, that process, we're not investigating it. And even if you wanted to find out, like, for instance, if I wanted to find out, there's no way that is documented. Uh, we haven't passed our recipes on uh, in terms of families, but if you go to West Africa, for instance, Jolof, and, and if you go to Ethiopia with their Dorowat, these are dishes that have been passed through generations, and their new generation of chefs can then innovate on those recipes that are passed down. So I think we need to investigate the recipes that are the backbone of our, of our cuisine, and then as chefs kind of like, uh, you know, innovate. Uh, I went to Mukuvisi once and foraged and found seven edible mushrooms. And uh, I think like when it's mushroom season, you rarely if ever find mushroom recipes in the restaurants. So I think as chefs as well, 
we need to really up our game and you know really showcase the ingredients that are available in Zimbabwe. Right. Yeah. And do you find um, someone Zaza is asking what kinds of dishes are popular with your audience? Is it the spin on the traditional or is it international dishes? I suppose well, you just I, have I to know if you're if you're going to uh, Tafadzo. I just know if it says Nopi, it will it, it might be ice cream on a flat. <laughs> yeah, the, the, well, the beauty of being a private chef is actually you interact with your clientele. And you actually say, I can do this or I can do that. And I've been lucky enough to have my clients say, I want to try that out. And uh, I once did uh, a tubu kind of custard. And then I told them, taste it first and tell me what it is. And most people were like chocolate or like this and that. And then I like tubu. And the whole table like, ah, tubu. So it's kind of like it's food. So I think uh, if people are open minded, and are willing to experiment. I think there's a space for private chefs as myself and chefs that are really trying to, you know, push the envelope in terms of food to really, you know, do something in the space. So, yeah, I generally, uh, people are really receptive to my food. I haven't had someone, well, a few people. <laughs> I once had someone tell me on, on Facebook, actually, that I'm being dis disrespectful to a dish. Those are not the ingredients that are going there. But I feel that I, I was showing the disrespect by actually giving it my own own spin-off. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tafazra. Um, so closing out the evening for us is one of the most exciting wine blenders on the African continent at the moment, Tinashe Nyamudoka. He's a celebrated sommelier international wine judge and the founder of Kumusha Wines. Sinashe, tell us about your incredible, incredible journey to founding your brand. Let's see, do we have Tinashe? Yes. It's on okay, YouTube, Tinashe. Fantastic. <laughs> Am I live now? Yes, go ahead, Tinashe. So, good evening, everyone, and thanks, Lucia, for the platform. Uh, it's good to be here, and it's been great listening to everyone who's been speaking already. So, yeah, geez, my journey is quite long, but I'm just going to cut it short. That I came to South Africa, what, 2008? Uh, you know, everything in 2008 was haywire, so I just followed the trek down south. Uh, yeah, it was pretty much survival mode when I when I landed in Cape Town, you know. Uh you couldn't find proper work because of permits and issues. I ended up working in a bakery uh for a few months. Uh which which was lovely because I I'd, I'd never worked in a bakery before, but by the time I left I could make my own hot cross buns and see a butter bread. Uh but eventually you know Zimbabweans are always resourceful and as a community you you kinda like you know, sass around. So by that time, you know, I needed money and it was pretty evident that most of the Zimbabwean guys were making money in the restaurants. So I threw CVs around and I was fortunate enough to, to get a waitering position where a newly restaurant was opening. Uh, and they ran a really lovely hospitality program called Let's Sell Lobster and they were teaching about, you know, the hospitality industry, especially people who didn't have any experience before. So I was kind of the guinea pigs there. Uh, and yeah, I was thrust into the hospitality industry. So I, I kind of say that's, that was my route to wine. Obviously in restaurants, it's, it's wine and food. So I literally had to learn how to carry a plate, how to clear a plate, you know, and most of these dishes were so foreign to me, you know, as I remember saying, you know, even how to pronounce an oyster, you know, foie, foie gras, even the, the wine itself, Melod, Company Sumio. So it was, but for me, it was something intriguing. Uh, but I soon realized that if you work in restaurants, I don't know, I mean, I've worked for waitress part time, but, you know, if you punt really nice, good wine in a restaurant, your, your guest check is up. Uh, and more so, you're going to get a nice service charge. So I kind of figured if I learned wine, uh, I'd sell more wine and get, make more money. So that's what got me into studying wine. But 
you know, the more you learn about wine, the more you get intrigued. So for some reason, I just fell in love with it. And I was so fortunate that around that time where mentors and people would just notice something in me. I was like, you know what, you can really take wine as a profession. Uh, and I was like, okay, maybe not, maybe. Uh, I changed jobs. I moved on to another restaurant. Then I went to work at the One and Only in 2009. Uh, so there, that's where I really like really delve into the world of wine. Uh, big hotel, uh, you know, international recognition. I know. Uh, for those who don't know, for those who don't know, one and only has it was sort of made up of like there was Nobu and Gordon Ramsay's restaurant. Yeah. yeah. So so when we opened the one and only Cape Town, it was Gordon Ramsay's the other side and Nobu Matsuisa on the other side. So I worked in in. And uh, amazed by Gordon Ramsay for 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 a year, and was only there for two times for for sure in TV. But it it was quite interesting that the whole world of wine opened up for me there. We had, we had a very strong seller, almost six thousand bottles, five hundred different labels. So I quickly learned, and I had very cool guys around me who were senior who taught me. So I spent one year in uh, Rubens, then I worked with a, a local chef who was probably one of the top chefs in South Africa, even up to now, uh, Ruben Riffel. Uh, then I on, went on to work in the Nobu restaurant, uh, more Japanese cuisine. So I spent almost four years at the one and only. Then I moved on to Kwasu Natal. I worked for the Oyster Box Hotel, uh, you know, Deben, Curry, Bunny Charles. So yeah, uh, like Tafaz was saying, I think Zimbabweans, we really not big on chili. So. <laughs> So it was quite interesting working in Durban with all the spices and the curries. And, you know, I remember my first time having Vindaloo the next morning was really like hell. Uh, then I spent a year and a half in KwaZulu Natal. Then, yeah, uh, opening opened up at the Test Kitchen restaurant in Cape Town. Uh, and, yeah, you know, the Test Kitchen at that time was the best restaurant in South Africa and in Africa for the past five years in a row. Uh, it was ranked number 28th best restaurant in the world, uh, on the world 50 best. So yeah, I mean, it was, it was a challenge. I couldn't say no. So I joined them in 2015. Uh, my first year there, I was, you know, best sommelier in South Africa on the eat out. The first time the restaurant had won it. That same year, I think we came 22nd best restaurant in the world, you know. So it, it, it just quite, quite, quite amazing. But, and it, for me... The test kitchen is really small restaurant, you know, it's, 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 I thought I knew food before I got to the test kitchen, but I, I really didn't understand what food, what, what's cuisine like, what's flavor, what, what Tafazwa says about. So for me, the test kitchen really gave me an awakening in the way Chef Luke Del Roberts does his dishes, constructed dishes, the ingredients he uses. Uh, the amount of time the chefs use. So in the test kitchen, chefs used to come out in the morning at 8 a.m. and they'll be the last ones to leave at 11 in the morning. So they're spending the whole day in the kitchen. And I remember some ingredients took like five days to plate just really one small ingredient on the plate. So for me, it, it all changed my whole philosophy about thinking of food and all. Uh, during the test kitchen time, uh, I've always been ambitious. I've always got an, an entrepreneurial bug in me, but I never knew in what ways it would come. But for some reason, when it comes to wine, I was one of the best tasters in South Africa. So I judge in most wine competitions. Now I judge internationally in Germany. Uh, I'd done my wine business school with the University of Cape Town. Uh, you know, so I had experience in work, working in restaurants. I had experience in all this stuff. And somehow I got an opportunity to make my own wine. So it, it started off, off as a side hustle. But then again, I think that time I was so intrigued because I was reading a book by Jonathan Nozietta. Uh, it's called Liquid Memory. And in it, he speaks of, you know, wine, in wine culture, in food, we talk of uh, terroir, where the wine is being grown, the culture, the people, the food. Uh, but what was really challenging when I came into wine was the association of flavors, especially the black currants, blackberries, you know, those terms people talk about when they're describing wine. But for me, it was so Eurocentric. 
I couldn't understand it because I'd never tasted a blackberry before. I'd never t tasted a red currant. I didn't even know how it looks. But someone was telling me I need to smell it. But it was so interesting at that point that, you know, a couple of Zimbabweans in Cape Town were almost into this wine and we came up with our terms. So, for instance, we'd pick up our own association of flavors. We'd pick up, you know, uh, Maroro in wine. We'd pick up Ute. We'd pick up... Uh, Habrosi would pick up Derere, would pick up all these weird things and associate it with wine. And, you know, it was so exciting then. And for me, it was the most exciting part because I was, I was here in a community where, you know, someone like me could associate wine in it. But obviously, because wine was elite, uh, you had to speak it in a different way. But we became rebellious that, okay, guys, I really pick up... Uh, you know, Maroro in this wine, I really pick up the other in this wine and it makes sense. And that's how we become good tasters as in Zimbabweans wine. So for me, it made sense. Uh, then in that book you were saying, you know, wine is an association. It's, it's something that you've tasted before, that you've seen before. So you can never smell a banana if you've never eaten or smelled a banana. So if, if, if I could reference something I was so familiar with, it made sense. So for me, wine was taking me home. It was taking me Kumusha, you know, with grandmother, Chipira Mumakomo, and, and, you know, picking all those fruits. So that's where the Kumusha name came about. And it was more of, it's just me reconnecting with my home. I'm in South Africa, but I, it, it just so made sense for me that I said, okay, this is what I want. And I just wanted people to right, really experience wine the same way I was feeling. So that's why I said I needed to make my own wine. I got the opportunity to bottle. I think in 2017, I started with 1,200 bottles, which really flew by. And it was quite interesting, the label part. Uh, you know, I was thinking if you look at most top wineries in South Africa or the world over, most of them have like a little, uh, their homestead on the label or the driveway, and there's those fancy chateaus, those fancy houses, I was like, but for me, Kumusha, it's my grandfather's rural home. That's what I'm gonna put on my label. Uh, and it so resonated with people when the wine came out, and you know, it just went viral, and people were interested, or some people didn't know if the wine was actually coming from Zim because of Kumusha, or some people didn't actually think someone can put a Kumusha on a wine label and be good, so. Yeah, it, it, was, it was amazing for me when it came out because, you know, you know, if you're creative or if you're a chef cooking in a kitchen and you conceptualize an idea and you put it in on a plate or you put it in a bottle, then you serve it up and people connect with it and enjoy it. I think that feeling, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's something special. Uh, then, of course, here we are, 2020. Uh, I'm now bottling 40,000 bottles of wines. I'm exporting to America. I'm exporting to the Netherlands. I'm exporting to Zimbabwe. I'm very soon Kenya, the UK. So it's just become global. That's incredible. That's incredible. I was curious, uh, we have a question uh, from Zaza. What wine would you pair with uh, Chef Tafadzo's dish of the uh, pumpkin? <laughs> The pumpkin. Well, well dessert wines dessert tend to lean towards sweet, sweeter wine, but like I, Tafazwa says, he's, he's more of a savory dessert kind of thing. So I think for that dessert, I would pair with my flame lily, uh, which I named after the Zimbabwe national flower. So it's a kind of a Ron style Cape blend, we say. It's more Roussan, Shannon, Fionia. It's quite rich, it's buttery, it's got lovely acidity. You know, it's got lovely texture, which really works with Tafazwa's dishes as well. And maybe, you know, so I've known Tafazwa, what, since 2013? And believe me, I have to say this on my own, is the most creative Zimbabwean chef I know in the world. Uh, just purely with his obsession of really trying to showcase Zimbabwean flavors on the plate. Uh, and really trying to understand how we made dishes in the past, our grandmothers and, and everyone. I think he's the only chef who's trying to, to, to do those boundaries. And I feel 
I honestly pray that it gets more recognition for what he's doing. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's for me, I think nowadays it's good that we, we've traveled and we know these different cuisines. But for my experience working in the test kitchen and working with the British chef, who was so obsessed about making dishes that he remembers his grandmother cooking, it, it makes much more sense. But now to see chefs nowadays who are trying to make Instagrammable dishes that just look uh, beautiful on the plate but lacking depth and flavor. That's why I find most of our Zimbabwean chefs or African chefs uh, trying to, to create their dishes. Whereas I feel chefs like Tafazo are really going on, on the actual flavor. And, and to think of it, I think we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, a tomato will always be a tomato. You know, cauliflower will always be a cauliflower. But it's just how you make it how the British made it, how the Japanese made it. And no one knows how the Zimbabwean perspective made it. And I think that's where we're losing it. And if we don't do that, then we're not going anywhere. We're just imitating. And do you see, see have you found this your market and you started it as your market for Um I, I think it's quite interesting how you essentially created your own space in a you know, in this sector? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's <laughs> the market has been, obviously when, when, I, when I came up with the brand and the wine, I was targeting African. It, it was purely people like me who would understand me. But you know, wine, <laughs> wine is a beverage and wine is a luxury. That's the first thing of all. First of all, a, a luxury brand or anything has to be good in the first place and people have to aspire to want it. So they, there's a lot of black owned brands, especially in South Africa, world over. But I think that just is not enough. For me, I wasn't worried that my wine was, wasn't good enough because I had experience and expertise to make a good wine. But you just needed to make it, to package it and make it uh, aspirable and make it a, a lifestyle. So for me, what I've done over the three years is make wine a lifestyle and trying to create conversations about it, African conversations about it, uh, try to be in the African food space as well as the European food space. So my market is so diverse. The traditional enjoy it because it's really good wine. Uh, then the the new people are just, because at the end of the day, you know, there, there's, I don't know how many wine labels in the world, but what differentiates them is, is the story. At the end of the day, it's, it's how you package it and how people resonate, resonate with the story. And for me, I've never shied away from the fact that, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, okay, now it's, we've kind of globalized everything and almost celebrate the Africanness in us. But I think we, we, we really can move away from our origins, you know, our roots. Uh, I'm, I'm a Zimbabwean, I'm a Manika from younger, that's where it starts. So if I can really go back and step my foot in it, then we're getting lost. That's how our history is getting lost. So I think my, my brand has resonated with people because it's, it's, it's going back to the origins and the roots. Then everyone just like takes it the way they want. Right, right. So Tendai is saying, you make us proud to Nashe and I'm definitely enjoying it. Are you actually, do you actually own your own winery or are you getting the wines from different wineries and blending it? All right. So, geez, <laughs> I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough, especially in, in South Africa, it's really uh, the topic of land ownership is it's quite, it's the same as Zimbabwe lands. But I think at the moment, my model is I don't own a vineyard at all. Uh, maybe in future I might get a piece of land, but I really work with, wineries who've got heritage. I think the winery I work with is a seven generation of winemaking. So there's a lot of history and roots and origins to it. So my brand is 100% black owned. I started it from scratch. Uh, and yeah, I don't own a winery at the moment. Uh, but maybe in future there's possibility I might make my vineyards kumusha, you know, with a bit of fun. You mentioned, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the wine making is a science, uh, but then the wine blending, which is what you do, uh, being, I guess, more of an art or more of the difficult part of 
uh, what we find in the bottle. Yeah, so the more so, sensitive yes. part. Exactly. So if you look at how wine made, wine is, you know, wine is a is made of from grapes and grapes. You have to farm grapes, uh, and the science part is because you take grapes, you crush them, you get you get sugar in the grapes, you put yeast, and you get alcohol. But the art of it is the, the blending, the maturity now. And when, when it comes to blending, it's like putting different blocks. Uh, you know, I want something with a bit of lift. I want something with fresher. I want something. That's how it ends up being in a bottle. And that's the most challenging part because you have to understand uh, what your intended clients tend to drink. Or sometimes, uh, so I, I've been bottling wine for three years. So the first bottling was actually my personal taste. Like wines I enjoy drinking, wines that I like my palate, wine that resonated with me. But then I soon realized, you know, it's only a few people who enjoy wines my style, but the general public enjoys a certain different profile of wine. So I had to go back in the cellar and really like, okay, I'm taking my sommelier head off. I'm going to make wines that I'll probably enjoy, but the whole mass would enjoy. So now in my range, I've got wines that I personally enjoy and hopefully others like me can enjoy. But the majority of it is like really wines that easily accessible, delicious wine that you can easily pair with food uh, and that you can really converse over and create. You know, wine is, is, is what really sets stories. Right. Talking about accessible, there's one wine I keep seeing on Instagram. Everyone's looking for it. I think it's the red. There's, there's yeah. one that's like not available anymore. And people are looking yeah. for this thing. Like, where can I, where can I get it? You know, which one, which one is that? Yeah, that's, that's the cap since wine. So for me, for me, that wine is really, you know, I, I feel really chuffed and like give myself a pat on the back because it's been a, it's taking me three vintages to get into that blend. Uh, and I remember when I, when I was in the cellar and really blending it with my winemaker, I said, you know, I want a wine, which is, is, you know, you don't have to think about it, but you just have to love. And most of all, I wanted a wine that someone would really open a second bottle without even thinking twice and just feel better about opening the third because there will be them there, you know, drunkards. But, and, and so now, you know, everyone who enjoys the wine is like, dude, we couldn't stop ourselves having the second bottle. And for me, you know, I was working in a restaurant and when you recommend and, and serve a table, uh, uh, a bottle of wine, the only way you know they're really enjoying it is when they order the second bottle. So for me, it was like, yeah, that's it. And I hope I can really follow up on the next vintage. So the wine, geez, I only made 6,000 bottles. <laughs> of that and all was sold in the space of three months so wow wow and now i want to ask also um uh this is for you and uh tendai um has being a migrant because you are both zimbabweans you're based in south africa in what ways has that been has that been an advantage or a disadvantage for you Go ahead, Tinashe. Well, I think, <laughs> you know, as a, as, a, as a migrant, first of all, you, you, you're stuck against the odds. There's so many challenges. Uh, but I think you, it's, it's a disadvantage and advantage in two worlds, depending on which side of a coin you want to look at it. Uh, but I think it's, you know, if you really, I always say success has no boundaries, there's, there's no borders, you know. If, if you're really doing well in Zim, you do anywhere in the world. There is no magic to, if you're really not doing well in Zim and expect to do well if you go to the UK, it, it doesn't happen like that. So, you know, whether wherever you go, you have to have it in you. So I think once you're in that situation, if you use it to advantage, it can be uh you know you know uh a force to use so for me the whole challenge was you know i know i'm a migrant and this talk of people taking our jobs and which is true you know we're really coming and making much more competitive but i wanted to make a statement that's you know migrants can sometimes be beneficial to to a host economy so 
which really I wanted to really export my wine, which I'm doing now. And obviously I'm adding more millions to the South African industry and the economy. So I think it, it's, it's a telltale. There's challenges, let's be honest. Uh, and you just have to be appreciative of the host country and respect it and respect the people and find common grounds to like really help each other. Um, and just just to uh, go off on that, uh, Tinashe, do you see do you see Kumusha wines ever going Kumusha and being based in Zimbabwe? Or what would it take? Jeez, uh, I wish the the climate was so conducive to vino, but I think our, our climate in general in Zimbabwe is not. You can make grapes. They are making wines in Mukuyu at uh, uh, what's the other one in Rua. Uh, Bushman Rock, but you know, it's not the best quality grapes. Just like in South Africa, we make wines, but it's not better wines than, uh, for instance, France or whatever. So I think making a vineyard in, in, in Zimbabwe would just be much more a nostalgic kind of feeling. <laughs> but as, as really good quality wines, I don't think Zimbabwe would ever be a point, maybe with climate change in years to come, but at the moment they won't really make competitive quality wines. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tinashe. So Tendai, on that question of how has uh, being a migrant, has that been a disadvantage or an advantage for you? Just to say before I answer you, um, uh, Tinashe's story is so inspiring. Uh, I was sitting here thinking to myself, wow, what, a, what an amazing story because, but I, it resonates, what his story resonates with mine in the sense that he discovered his passion while he was here in South Africa. I think for me, that's the same kind of storyline where I, I never thought that I would actually do acting when I was in Zimbabwe because acting is not a career path that a lot of young people take. Generally, the society doesn't take the arts as um, you know, as, as a profession, it's more of a hobby. You know, people don't become actors just because they, you know what I mean? <laughs> people become doctors and lawyers. And so I actually um, only decided to be an actress while I was here because I saw other people actually building careers in the acting industry. You know, I saw actors on TV, people could actually build careers here. And for me, that was, I think, a defining moment where I could literally place my passion into a career path. And um, like what he said, I have a lot of respect for my journey here in South Africa because, um, like I said, I discovered my passion here and I got trained here and I got my exposure here. And so I, I there's no way that I am who I am today without my experiences here in South Africa. Have there been challenges? Yes, definitely. Um, being a foreigner, sometimes um, I don't qualify for certain jobs or um, the language barrier as well has been a big deal um, because I don't speak fluent. Uh, I mean, first of all, there are so many languages that are spoken here. And so I haven't really nailed one um, and become fluent in any of them. But um, again, you know, it's, it's about like what Tinashe has been saying. It's about how bad you want something and just how... I, was, I actually tweeted this the other day that Johannesburg has taught me how to really hustle and grind. Um, you know, I've been, I've been taught a lot of things, character building things, being in such a competitive and thriving economy where it's really up to your hard work and your vision. Um, it's almost like your efforts are rewarded if you keep persevering. You know, there's a chance for your efforts to act and you get something at the end of the day. So it's really up to you really. Um, and I, I've been, I've been fortunate, I think, to get exposure here, and I'm really grateful for it. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I think uh, let's circle back to Thomas and just uh, as a concluding remark about what, what's next on the horizon uh, for you in your journey to the post couple. What is, what is next? Um, gosh, what's next? Um, I'm, I'm really not sure yet. Um, I think I think it's you know we're we're still uh, in cook off mode. Um, I think I think you know as as much as um, you know uh, as as Chef Taff uh, alluded to you know within the cuisine there's still a lot of work to do within filmmaking there's still a lot of work to do as well. So 
in our case, you know, we made a film, but uh, the, the distribution of that film is there's not, it's not like there's another company that can do the distribution for you so that now you can move on to the next project. You know, you, you, you end up in a boat where you still have to be working on the project, you know, well after the film is finished and done to, to be able to keep, uh, you know, uh, extracting as much value as you can out of it. Um, there have been, there have been uh, queries about a cook-off too, um, but it's not something that uh, we ever planned from the beginning. So, and there's, you know, it's not something that there's a solid uh, idea for or, or anything like that. Um, I don't know. I, I think in, in generally, you know, we have, we have a lot of powerful stories within Africa. You know, really what I want to do as a filmmaker now is to, to make, uh, make films which inspire the next generation of filmmakers, you know, to, to kind of really, I think we can, we, can, we can do much better, we can go much further, you know, but you, you have to, it, it doesn't happen by magic and it doesn't happen overnight. You, you know, you build those steps and then the next generation of filmmakers will make films better than we can possibly make because we are limited by, you know, the films that we had growing up. So we have a limited experience, but we can open their minds, you know, we can open them to new and exciting ideas that we can't even have ourselves. So I'm, I'm excited about how that really works for the, for the next generation. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Tendai, what's next for you? Well, <laughs> um, I am really wanting to uh, explore the international scene a bit more. So I'm really looking forward to working on international projects. And so everything that I'm doing now is preparing me for that. Right now in 2020, our industry has been a bit quiet, but I think it's given us a lot of time to reflect, to re-strategize. And so uh, besides just kind of, uh, you know, working on the next steps for going on to international work. I've also been writing and exploring, you know, um, like the next creative step I want to take. And maybe in the future, I'll be directing some films. That's something that I'm interested in. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's awesome. kind of like what's awesome. Is right now. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And also, just by the way, I am. I am on a project called um, Working Wives. It's an independent uh, TV show. Uh, it's currently a web series and it's been produced by a um, fantastic group of women. It's an independent, uh, self-funded film, uh, I mean, TV show. And it's, on, it's available online on Vimeo at the moment. And so if anyone wants to check out any other work that I've done, I'm also in that show, uh, Working oh, Wives awesome. on Vimeo. Oh, yeah. awesome. Put that in the chat. Do you can, okay. you can add a link in the chat as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, awesome. Diankara Chef, what is next for you? And also someone had asked, have you and um, Tinashe considered collaborating? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, we've, we have collaborated before. Uh, I do pop up pop-ups so Tinashe when he was down I was lucky enough to to work with him but uh, definitely I would want to learn more from him because he's been exposed to a high level of of cooking and if I cook for Tinashe and he likes my food definitely I know I'm on the right track so I'm looking forward to more collaboration once this corona allows us to travel uh, and uh, yeah what's next for me uh, I'm really praying for season four of Battle of the Chefs and uh, I'm really on a journey to discover more about Zimbabwean cuisine, Zimbabwean ingredients, African ingredients, and obviously doing more pop-ups, getting more people to try my food, and uh, hopefully work, collaborate with more creatives, uh, be it sommeliers like Tinashe, be it up-and-coming young chefs, because I don't think there's a platform where, which allows our young chefs to really shine, so hopefully create a platform where we can have pop-ups where young chefs come through and really show themselves on a plate. And then, yeah, hopefully the, the populace will appreciate chefs and pay us more for our creativity. 
<laughs> awesome, awesome. And then Tinashe, uh, what's next for for Kumusha? Uh, is uh, I think Kumusha. I've seen it really grow big, uh, and I've seen the the positive effects it's had. Uh, for so you know, the next goal is to I always say I have to sell a million bottles in Africa in the next five years, which is going to be possible soon. Uh, but you know, I didn't call it Kumusha for a reason. I think my heart has been yearning for home. So most of my projects are going to be Zim based. I think uh, there's a renaissance. People are starting to appreciate wine. They're starting to discover food, and I want to be part of it. You know, I want to be. If I'm not part of it, then I think I'll, I'll feel left out. But that's the, the the challenge as well. And you know, people always say, "But the economy, no." Oh, but you know. Whenever the economy is not working, what do people do? They eat and drink. So, yeah. Right. Awesome. Well, a huge, huge, huge thank you to our panelists today, uh, who are actually the four T's <laughs> from the Teapot Country. Uh, Thomas, Tendai, Tafalska, Tinashe, uh, thank you so much for the generous gift of your time. Um, a very big thank you also to my A-team behind the scenes, uh, Simeon, Steph, and Nana. Uh, just as an aside, Steph and Nana visited me in Zimbabwe five years ago. Let's just say what, what happens in Harare stays in Harare. Okay, we know that story. And then the biggest thanks of the night, of course, goes out to all of you amazing people for joining in, especially uh, the folks who I call the frequent flyers, those who've been with, tuning in with us since Accra, in July, uh, then Nairobi in August, and now Harare, thank you. Cities on a Plate will spend the remaining part of the year fueling up for new destinations in 2021. So follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Lisale, um, Sarajakanaka, good night. Cheers, everyone, thank you. Thank you so much.